Hey everybody, it's Gil and Deb here with the Sailing Vessel Dream Chaser. And in this week's episode, we're going to talk a little bit about marinas in Florida and ultimately why we want to sail Dream Chaser and be in the west coast of Florida. So even prior to purchasing Dream Chaser when we had the Gulf Star last affair, our goal was to ultimately end up in Florida. Um, we shifted that a little bit after we got Dream Chaser. We had, of course, some repairs to do on there. Then we had some family stuff come up that we needed to take care of to do all of that. So now we are continuing on with that dream to go to Florida. And this is our first week study here for a full week looking at property, marinas, RV parks, and trying to find what would fit for our needs. So if I think about the reason why we wanted to go to Florida, there's essentially four reasons. One is warmer weather, two is warmer water, three is clearer water, and the fourth one really is, frankly, it's a bit of an easier sail. Like it might be cool to be in Fort Lauderdale or Lake Worth, uh, Florida, where we could take a long weekend and bounce on over to the Bahamas. But that's a little bit more extensive of a sail than what we are ready for. So let us go into some detail about each of the four reasons and um, why we ultimately are making that choice. One of the first considerations we took into moving to Florida was the, the much warmer water that they have here versus where we were in Louisiana or even in Texas. Do you remember when we went swimming on that little island in Charlotte Harbor? We pulled the boat up and you went swimming in that. Was that fun? Yeah. Yeah. Remember we swam through that deep part and we got to the shallow part and we stood up again? Pretty cool. Yeah. Last summer we took the girls to uh, Charlotte Harbor uh, near Punta Gorda, Florida and just did a, a day excursion, you know, hired a, a small boat and, and took us out for viewing dolphins and manatees and just a, a cruise around the harbor, uh, Charlotte Harbor itself so we could see it. And one of the stops we made was on a, a little anchor island where all the boats sort of nose up there in the weekends and go swimming and whatnot. So the girls had a, had a good time with that. Um, where we were swimming, we could actually see fish out there. It was that clear, so it was pretty cool. But as Deb mentioned, this warmer water piece is a big consideration for us. Where we are just north of Lake Pontchartrain um, in Louisiana, we're at about 30 degrees latitude. Where we're looking in Florida is along the western coast, kind of from Tampa all the way as far south as Cape Coral, um, not quite to the Everglades. And that's anything from 26 to, 20, um, 26 to 29 degrees of latitude. So dropping that additional three degrees or so of latitude certainly makes mm -hmm. a difference yes, in the temperature. Um, by way of example, this week we are here in Florida and um, I looked at the weather earlier, it was like 39 degrees uh, last night in New Orleans and it was like 58 here. So about a 20 degree difference in temperature for that small amount. Now clearly there could have been a cold front coming through or something, but a, a pretty significant difference. The second big consideration for us, aside from the warmer weather, was absolutely the clearer water. When Deb and I first started sailing, gosh, 15 years ago or so, in a suburb of Dallas on a lake, yeah. we we fell in love with it. We almost immediately said, man, we really want to get on bigger water. We were landlocked on a lake. So we kind of uprooted and we moved to Galveston, Texas area along the uh, Galveston Bay. And by doing that, we were able to sail our boat in a much larger body of water that had access to the Gulf of Mexico. So our, our dream for bigger water sort of came true. Um, we knew we were going to end up living aboard a boat, so we started shopping for a bigger boat, a liveaboard size. We found that boat. Uh, we sailed it from Panama City, Florida, back to Clear Lake, uh, near north of Galveston. And um, once we did that, we then changed our saying about being on bigger water to being on bigger, bluer water. And there is nothing big nor blue about the Chifuncta River, north of Lake Pontchartrain, <laughs> that's an eight hour sail to the Gulf of Mexico. <laughs> We're a long way from it. So part of this long standing dream has been working our way back eastward, east of the Mississippi for sure, where the water is significantly clearer. Our third big consideration for moving to Florida is absolutely the warmer water. We talked before about the warmer weather and those three degrees of latitude south certainly make a difference in that air temperature. It makes a significant difference in the water temperature as well. So for those of you that don't know, uh, there is a, a website called the National Buoy Data Center. Um, it's part of NOAA and I'll put some links, I'll put some links down below on our blog post about this as well. Uh, but at that site, 
you can pull up a map of uh, any of the oceans um, and you can click on every single NOAA owned or private station that publishes its data back to the National Buoy Data Center. Uh, these buoys capture a range of different information. Most of them will get air temperature, water temperature, sea state, sea height, wave height, and wave interval. Uh, oh, and, and wind speed. I don't, did I say wind speed? I don't think so. And wind speed. Um, we've been using them for years. When we'll see a low pressure system uh, on the weather, we'll kind of go out to the buoys and look at the data and the wind speed, and it helps us understand weather patterns and sort of in a self-education method for, uh, for learning weather. But these, the buoy data is really interesting. So just to show an example of the water temperature differences, um, I pulled up a, uh, a set of data from a buoy that is just south of what they call Shell Beach. It's kind of on the Louisiana-Mississippi line, a few miles offshore. And then I also did the same thing off of Englewood, Florida, which is just north of Venice, uh, between Fort Myers and Tampa. So looking at these two different buoy data sets, it's actually seven degrees warmer in the water off the Florida coast than it is off the Mississippi-Louisiana coast. Again, three degrees of latitude and a significant difference in that water temperature. The fourth big consideration for us and the move to the western coast of Florida is frankly, it's an easier sail. And it almost pains me to say that, but I often joke that our sailboat is more capable than its skipper. Um, I was probably not as nervous about this earlier. I'm more nervous about it now. We have some really good friends, experienced sailors that sailed from Galveston to Tampa and then ended up having some problems with their boat. They needed to kind of come into Venice and do some repairs in Venice. Um, and it, it made me realize how a very well-prepared uh, boat and skipper can still run into some challenges. And I look, at, I look at this friend of ours who is frankly a better captain than I am and a boat that is in better shape than ours and it makes me a little nervous because of that exact reason. So something that I've just sort of considered, um, I think there's certainly ways of mitigating that. Obviously we need to do a shakedown cruise before we bring it across yep. the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, we have some things we still need to complete on the boat. Still needs a battery bank uh, set up. Uh, I probably will end up replacing a shifter cable at some point, though that's not critical. My sails are in plenty of good shape and the rigging's in plenty of good shape that, you know, heaven forbid we had a problem with the motor, we could still sail the rest of the way there. So the big question becomes, we're coming to Florida, where are we going to bring the boat? Um, we had considered just putting in a marina. I, you know, you diehard cruisers will probably sort of roll your eyes a little bit and say, we're not cruisers, we're liveaboards. But frankly, we have found, we have found a method of cruising or a method of liveaboard that fits our lifestyle our work schedule, our family situation, and allows us to enjoy the heck out of it without necessarily always being, um, you know, hook. yeah, on the hook somewhere. Um, so we frankly have enjoyed marinas to some extent. Um, I know they're more costly, and I know we won't do it for our entire cruising um, stint. But we're kind of looking at marinas. You want to talk yeah. a little bit about the marinas we found? we we came down last summer just to kind of do a quick look at some marinas, get us some ideas on it. Um, because at that point last year, we really hadn't set a date. Well, I set a date. The rest of the family wasn't on board yet. So I had to work on it. Most things that happen with us, Deb is the pusher or the driving <laughs> force to actually having it happen. I tend to be much more conservative, mm -hmm. think these things through or overthink them through. Overthink. And Deb says, let's just go already. So it's, it's a just good, pack it's up a, and it's go. A good give I and mean, take. it's just... Oh. I think part of that comes from my upbringing of moving every two years. It was just, you just go. You figure it out on the way. You fix things as they go. I don't know. It's just my style, I guess. And that, that makes my head hurt. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes, it does. Um, but I do plan out a lot of stuff. But I'm yeah. I'm also a very go-with-the-flow type person. So, um, But with looking at the marinas, we had to take into some considerations because one of the things that... You know, obviously, we have not started the homeschool process yet. So the girl, um, we do have the 12-year-old, uh, doesn't really want to do the homeschool. She wants to be in public school and have that social aspect of it. So, you know, for us living on the hook and having to dingy in every day, I'm just not willing to do it. Can't say, you know, we could do it. I don't want to. Bottom line. I want the comfort of being able to get on and off the dock to take her to and from school activities and, and things like that and not have to constantly dingy around and everything. Um, 
it's just easier for me with Gil traveling. Sometimes it's just me and the two girls. And, you know, I just, I really needed that ease of being in a marina. So we looked at um, Punta Gorda area. So we, we kind of said we want to be somewhere between Sarasota, Cape Coral area, somewhere along the coast in there. We haven't really set a specific area. So we started looking at different marinas. Um, things to take into account for Florida. I have been watching where they're changing the mooring laws. So marinas are filling up a lot more quickly than they were in the past. Uh, there's, as with every marina, there's limited numbers that have liverboards. So um, most of them have at least a six month waiting list. Some are a little bit shorter, but some of the nicer ones that are closer to the school systems, um, closer up into Sarasota, St. Pete area, have a little bit of a longer waiting list because one of the things I looked at is the slip feet covers your slip and the water that's it so if we pay a little bit more we're still gonna have to pay the electric whether we were at the marina or anything else so we started looking at that and I thought well what if we get a place and maybe Airbnb the house for a couple you know still live on the boat but maybe Airbnb the house for you know a few weekends or if we have family coming in town and um, We've also looked at the idea of buying a lot and then building something. It was eye-opening for me. Yeah. I will say I, I really never even considered it. We were just sort of thinking, okay, we'll take that $300 a month we pay now. We'll bump that up to 1000 whatever it's going to be. Um, and like I said before, we have found a way to modify our cruising lifestyle, which means we still have stuff, dreaded stuff, right? So we both each have a vehicle. We have the camper, which has been, frankly, um, I'm almost going to say a necessity the last year while the boat's been being yeah. refit. And, and we've enjoyed it. We have really enjoyed the flexibility of, of being able to, just like you do just with a boat, take, a take it, yeah, take it, go with your home. Um, you know, we're sitting here today. This, this is actually the camper. This is <laughs> we're it. sitting in the dinette of the camper. Um, and, uh, you know, hook it up to the truck and drive on down here to... Um, to the Bradenton, Florida area and stay for a week and we're set. Um, you know, we'll take the camper back with us again to Louisiana and go back onto the boat and at spring break, we'll hook it back up to the truck again and we'll go down by Fort Myers a little further south. Um, and then at the end of school, at the end of May, we're gonna hook it back up again and head back down this way again. And it, the flexibility to be able to do that and have your stuff with you is pretty handy. Yeah. So it was- it, Why is there granddaughter told us we live like turtles we just carry our home on our back or behind us you know so um but as Gil said it's with the, the boat being on the hard with five-year-old and a 12 year old living in up on the hard in was just not gonna happen I'm not gonna lug the baby on and up a ladder that I could barely get up some not days for that, not for that long it would have been not awesome. for that long so for us the camper has you know really been a lifesaver while we were doing the work on the boat so and as i shared in the video last week we've enjoyed it i think more than either of us thought we would and and we're now starting to even consider this thought that as much as we love the boat we six like the flexibility blue, of six yeah green. <laughs> exactly I, you know part blue part green travel um it sort of works um but going back to this I, it was eye-opening for me i thought you yeah, were just going to change that slip rent and because we have this stuff right we're going to have to bring it here right we need to find a place to store the camper um you know we have probably one of the cheapest places i know of by where we keep the boat to store the camper at 85 bucks a month you know just in a, in a lot basically um that seemed fairly reasonable i know covered parking these things can be as much as 300 a month but we had that with the slip rent um interestingly dry enough, storage for our dinghy yeah dry storage for the dinghy and Again, stuff, right? We have like a mule, like a golf cart. I'm thing. not getting rid of my mule. I don't, we won't get rid of it yet, depending on where we go. Uh, no, we, we found a ramp that could have golf cart on your back of your boat. I can get that mule on the back of the boat. Yeah, last week, remember in the episode last week, I talked about those Marquip steps. I was browsing their website when I was looking for that angled platform, and Marquip actually makes a uh, a set of ramps and a lift that you can put golf carts on your boat now clearly that is a coming boat, future <laughs> that is a boat significantly larger than ours yeah. with somebody that has more money than us but i thought that's that was greatness um but, but let's let me talk a little bit about the property thing because this was interesting to us i i didn't i really had no idea what property would cost and as deb mentioned she saw some really inexpensive um, so we started looking and you know when you go search search realtor.com for waterfront homes you'll find a ton 
The problem is that waterfront may very well be a pond, a canal, a bayou, a swamp, behind bridges, two feet of depth, dry yeah. at low tide. Like, there is just no consistency to, or there's not a category or filter that says navigable, navigable waters. Navigable? Navi navigatable? Navigable? Navigatable. There's nothing to do that. I don't, I'm sure I screwed up that word. Um, so when we started looking, it meant that we had to do a lot of research and not a slam on the profession because realtors absolutely know homes and home markets very, very well and land. What the vast majority don't completely understand is the water sides of that particular equation. So we would talk to a realtor or look at a realty listing that would say, deep water access to the Gulf of Mexico. I would pull up the charts and it was two feet deep or three feet deep. We had um, one that said deep access for a sailboat. Right. It was three feet of water. Yeah. And, and we've seen... And it is... You can get a small sailboat. Not our sailboat. Right. We've also but. seen a lot of them that will say waterfront Gulf of Mexico access. However, it happens to be behind a fixed bridge right. that is of height that won't work for us. Um, so it's funny. I will... Uh, I'll show a little image right up here. Um, right up here. And I probably won't do it right over Deb's head. I'll do it right here. Right between us. Um, I'll put an image right there of, of a map that I put together for Deb and I as we were searching. It basically, when I went to the charts and I marked every single bridge with either a red X or a green check or a yellow circle. Yellow circle meaning could be iffy. Green, we're good. You know, it's either high enough or it's a movable bridge or red ain't happening. Um, having the bridge aspect for me was, was really helpful because then I could just not even look at property on the other side of that bridge. We found a couple that are right along the intercoastal waterway that leads to the Gulf. You know, five minutes, leave your house, you're in the Gulf, which for me is, I just can't imagine that after, that you know, awesome. five minutes to get to the first bridge to get out to the Gulf in our eight hour day. The good thing for us is we're not like, we have to have a place by this time frame. I know this is taboo a little bit to talk about money, but I will say we have found things that range from $5,000 up to a million dollars. Yeah. And what we have found is you sort of get what you pay for. I, let's eliminate everything on the top end because frankly, we don't live like that, right? We're the clampets to some extent. We're the people that the neighbors are gonna go, oh, no, not them. Um, <laughs> but, and, and I'm okay with that, right? Me too. Um, but I'm also not necessarily on that $5,000 scale. I don't wanna set up a tent in my backyard um, right. and, and you know have to take a, a shovel on the front of the bow of the boat to get in and out. So what that really means is somewhere in that that one third range, right? Let's say two fifty to four hundred tends to be where, these, where we're, yeah, where, where these, we're landing, right? Where and that's where the properties tend to have deep enough water access without bridge restrictions, and small homes. When I say small, like a lot of them are two bedroom, one bath. Some are three ones. They're old style Florida homes. Most are single story. You know, you sort of look. They look like they're built in the sixties or seventies, right? A lot of them are. Yeah, they and, call it the old Florida, Floridian. Yeah, all homes, the Floridian homes. Um, with the small living area, large outdoor area. We're not going to live in the house. Right. Hey, yeah, we're, I, I mean, we should so, make that a point. Like, we're not looking we're to not move looking, into a house. <laughs> we're looking for the place to put the boat. And then, you know, occasionally Airbnb the, the house. Um, we did talk about possibly renting the house out, but I'm not keen on having the idea of having renters 24-7 around. So we're actually... I'm shocked at this. We're, we're thinking about it in relation to how close are we to things that somebody might want to rent it for a weekend on. Um, and every one of them we're looking at must have deep water access, must have the ability for the boat to be there. You know, I, I'd have to make sure that we had 30 and 50 amp service out there. Like the whole bit needs to be ready to go for it. And the, the interesting thing is um, we were even talking about depending on how much waterfront access there is setting up the piers of the docking system in a way that would allow a spare dock there. We could keep the dinghy or kayaks in when it's just us. And frankly, when it's not just us and somebody Airbnb is it, Airbnb is it, Airbnb is it, when somebody rents it out for a weekend or whatever, they would have the ability to bring their boat, right? Uh, you know, you can dock right there at the water. We'll keep looking and it's a little scary. Frankly, we haven't had a mortgage in Ten years. Ten years now. Um, <laughs> and it's been nice not having yeah, a mortgage. It's, it's very nice. It, it's very nice it's to know. It's been very nice not having. Really, I mean, everything we have is paid for. Yeah. Our, when your biggest Cars are debt, paid for, when your biggest debt for. is the insurance on the boat or your Starbucks habit, yay! <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's a pretty so, good thing. Um, so it is scary to jump back into that because we worked. We worked very hard to get to that point where we could have, the cruising lifestyle with very minimal things, and so. To jump back into that is is very scary, but 
it's the reality of what we need for for our situation right now. Yeah, it also it's also let us take money and put it aside for other things. It also let us everything you've seen in the last year on the boat. You know, wasn't uh, wasn't alone, right? That's another good thing about this. We've always said we would never finance a hobby. Uh, and we and haven't. Despite the fact that the boat is our home, we always viewed it like a hobby, and we refuse to finance that hobby. So, uh, by finance it, I mean. Um, you know, put a loan against it. If we want to do it, this is what it costs, and here's what we're going to have to go pay to do it. So that's been pretty nice to be able to do. Yeah. All right. I think we'll probably wrap this up. We're going to go yep. meet. We're going to go meet another realtor and continue looking at some places in Punta Gorda today. Yes. So, hey everybody, thanks a bunch for letting thanks us. For uh, yeah, thanks for listening. Thanks for letting us share some of this with you. This non-boat related semi-boat related yeah, topic but it's fairly boat related but these are the realities then but this is this is our life this is what we're dealing with it you know our modified cruising lifestyle and my um, guess is we're dealing with it there's somebody else that's thinking about some of these same things as well so don't be bidding against any property on us that's right because i'm not <laughs> going to tell you where my favorites are <laughs> safe sailing everybody see ya